The path for the Israelites to the Promised Land was not without obstacles, and they had to defeat both the armies of Sion and Og, which wasn't an easy task. Buoyed by their recent victories, they encamped on the plains of Jordan, close to where the Jordan meets the Dead Sea. Here, Balak, the king of the Moabites, enlisted the help of Balaam to curse the Israelites. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2 verse 15 that he loved the wages of unrighteousness, willing to go against his conscience for monetary gain. Balak's plan, though, did not work, and Balaam was unable to curse the Israelites. What they were unable to accomplish by cursing, they did by deceit, and invited to a festival by Balaam. The Israelites were beguiled by the music, the dancing, the indulgence, and the sexuality, and were soon in open sin, with the leaders amongst the first to sin. This apostasy was quickly put down, but not without tragic consequences for those involved. Oftentimes in life, we are distracted from our goals and our mission when we are the closest to achieving them. Before crossing the River Jordan, Moses laid his hands on Joshua and set him apart as leader of the Israelites. He then repeated the law to the people and gave some final warnings and admonition. As they prepared to cross the Jordan, Joshua sent spies across into the land to check out the city. They were hidden and protected by Rahab at great peril to her own life. And in return for her kindness, she was told that she and her family would be protected when the city was taken. The River Jordan lay before them, not a small stream as it is today due to the water being siphoned off for agricultural usages. It was a raging river in full flow, and the people watched as the priests, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, walked towards the water, and then as their feet entered the water, the river receded. God wanted to test their faith this time, and it wasn't until they had entered the water that he moved it back. As they crossed the River Jordan, they then encamped at Gilgal. Despite being recently accustomed to war, the Israelites were not told to march on the heavily fortified Jericho. Instead, they were told to march around the city once a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, they were told to march around it seven times and then blow their trumpets. And as they did, miraculously, the walls came tumbling down. The victory was not down to anything they had done, but it was all down to God. Jericho began to be excavated from the 1930s onwards, firstly by Garstang and then by Kathleen Kenyon, and their findings corroborate much of the biblical account. They found store jars full of grain, indicating that it was a very short siege and also happened during the time of the harvest. They also found that the walls fell outwards rather than inwards, allowing the Israelites to climb over on their way in. Today, the ruins of the city lie here and there is not much left testament to the fact that when God destroys something, it is completely destroyed. Israel was reminded time and time again that their greatest victories did not come from their military strategy or achievements. It did not come from their material possessions or intellect. Time and time again, God delivered them in such a way where it is impossible for any man to take the credit. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for people on whose behalf he can show his power. May we have hearts that are in tune with God that he can show his power through us.